What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast, the official podcast of MetalNexus.net, where you can get all your show reviews, concert photos, interviews, and so much more. And with me, as always, is Daniel Terry. How are you doing this evening? I'm good. I'm awake, basically. I fell asleep a couple times earlier tonight, but uh, then I was like, oh, no, I've got responsibilities and stuff. Absolutely. Uh, this is a uh, rather large episode. Uh, the guest is John Dyer Baisley, uh, vocalist and guitarist and illustrator for uh, Baroness. This is uh, this is an interesting one. I don't necessarily know if uh, a lot of people would assume that we would have uh, John or anyone from Baroness on the show, but I think that's the thing that's kind of fun about the show is that we've been evolving and getting a lot of great guests lately. Uh, some, you know, I think the John Cooper from Skillet I think is a great example. Like you may not expect us to to do that, but then when you hear it and you hear how long of a fan Dan's been, it's like eh, it works. Yeah, totally. That was a fun interview to do. I was originally hoping to get to do this one too, but uh, we ended up, I think, rescheduling a couple times. So mm -hmm. my uh, my window of opportunity started closing rather quickly on that. Yeah, it was kind of interesting because uh, I was supposed to call John, or actually John was supposed to call me, and then he sent me a text uh, after just scheduling issues the first time, and was one of those things where I started texting him a little bit uh, throughout the week. And then when we redid this, um, I think I kind of got more of a sense for who he was. Doc Coyle, once again, uh, had put out his episode with John from Baroness, and I was like, damn it, Doc. You always put out like an episode of somebody that I, I'm getting ready to talk to or that we have just done uh, either you know so close to one another. And obviously it's due to like the press junket cycle that a lot of people are in. But it was one of those things like Doc, you know, always is kind of the, the – the benchmark for where I would like our podcast to be as far as like how articulate he is, the kind of questions he asks and so forth. And, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with John and it really made me start second guessing ours. Cause I had already done it. And I was like, can I, can I get a redo please? Let's just do the same thing again. Only, um, better. Yeah. I'm going to have to ask better questions. <laughs> right. I think that, I mean, I know we have said this plenty of times. I think someone of John's level, I mean, he's a very focused and intense guy um, and, you know, gives a lot of, and like, I think the thing that that is interesting about John is like, you ask him, you could ask him a very simple question and he doesn't give you a canned answer. And I know that's something we talk about quite a bit is, you know, getting canned answers from the people you're interviewing because they're just in full on junket mode. And so it becomes one of those things where you're like, oh, okay, like I heard you say this already. And then you just kind of like lose interest as the person doing the interview because you've already heard the answer. With John, I've heard similar questions be asked to them, but he doesn't answer them the same at all. There might be some, some carryover phrases or, or uh, ideas, but as a whole, the, the answer is unique unto the interview as it's happening at that time. And I, and I do really appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. It's one of those, well, they're not making it up. I mean, it's it's one thing to tell the same story twice. There's a little bit more truth to that. But on the same token, it's also like, you know, whenever we get canned answers from people, I'm always like, man, I literally just listened to you say this on Toomey's podcast last week. <laughs> y you know, or, or, or whatever. And uh, th that can be frustrating. This was unique, mostly just in how thoroughly he answered the questions. Yeah. Um it's kind of, you know, when you listen to a few of his, and that was why I really wanted to have more of a, a standard interview from my perspective where I've written everything down, my questions kind of have a, a an arc to them from start to end. I think that kind of works a lot better with someone like John. I don't, for me personally, and, and given the, the nature of how the, the podcast format is, I don't necessarily know that I could do just a very loose chat with him because I, I think I would get lost in trying, like, I would just get lost in listening to him talk and then I'd be like, oh, fuck, it's my turn. Like, if we're, if, you know, if a conversation is, is a game of, like, ping pong where you're going back and forth, I think I would definitely drop the ball every time because I would just get lost in listening to, like, his story and, and his, you know, his, uh, his answers. Yeah, totally. And it's funny, this is one of those interviews where he would talk for so long that I, you would come in with a question and be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is, I'm not just listening to, to a different podcast right now, like, this is, this is us. <laughs> it's funny, in listening back to the interview to edit it, I had that same feeling where a couple of times I was like, this feels like I'm listening to somebody else's <laughs> podcast, and, yep, it, and totally. that doesn't usually happen for me. Like, usually I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this, or I... I don't know. It's very weird. It was it was a very weird feeling going through the almost hour and just being like, 
I feel like I was actually listening to like Lead Singer Syndrome or To Me or you know any of the other podcasts I would have been listening to that John would have been on. And then I like when it's all done, it's like, oh yeah, there I am. Oh yeah, it's my show. I, I forgot. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm I'm still alive, and I'm 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 making a podcast. Yes. Yeah. But uh, I think. All that aside, with this interview being so long, let's get into my conversation with John from Baroness, and we will talk to you afterwards. So I have the pleasure this uh, early evening of talking to John Dyer Baisley, uh, a Baroness, singer-guitarist, and all-around artist. Uh, their newest album, Golden Grey, is out now via, I think it's Abraxian Hymns? Uh, it's, yeah, the label's called Abraxan Hymns. Abraxan, okay. Again, going back to that whole Midwest, East Coast thing, I don't know where the vowels lie. <laughs> Most people don't. But you guys are currently in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, as of today, of when we're recording, uh, in support of the new record. And, you know, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you guys started, I mean, not officially, but started this tour cycle off uh, doing a mini acoustic tour of indie record stores. And, you know, I know from living here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, you've done quite a bit with our local record store, and I've seen you do quite a bit with local record stores. So I kind of wanted to know, how did this run you know, come about and what is the importance of working with, you know, independent record stores and so forth? What does it mean to you? Well, I mean, the easiest way to put it is, is that, I, that, um, you know, I own and operate an independent, uh, record label and, you know, and therefore, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been dealing with the independent retailers for a long time. Uh, even before, even before we were, you know, when, back when we were signed to uh, relapse records, um, but, you know, the, the, one of the characteristics of this band that, that has, you know, become more and more obvious over the years is that we, uh, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, physical product, we, we rely very heavily on, uh, selling vinyl and, uh, you know, and I, it, it should come as no surprise that at this point in 2019, that, you know, the, the best place to find, uh, vinyl is in, you know, in, in the indie retailers, uh, I think that, I think there are some major chains that you know sort of toy around with the idea of of selling vinyl and and everything, but it always you know to me it always comes off as a little uh, like like a cute thing that they're doing. Uh, whereas with the indie retailers, um, I I am I am always aware that I'm I am amongst like-minded people, meaning uh, that you know no nobody in their right mind starts a band or starts an independent record store because they think there's going to be a whole lot of money in it. Um, it's, it's, it is absolutely a pursuit of passion to be involved in this industry, uh, at time. And, you know, at most of the time, uh, you know, every once in a while we, we, we or they, or we, you know, any of us can experience, uh, you know, the, those windfalls that, that we keep waiting for. But, you know, by and large, I think that, you know, for, the, the most positive, most inspiring uh, people that I work with are the people who get involved and get their hands dirty and uh, in the way that uh, the indies do. And, you know, they're, they're, they, these are stores that are located in, you know, in various, in almost every, you know, city around, around the country. And, uh, you know, it's usually, it's usually a small group of people that work there and they know so much about music they care so much about it uh that it's it, you know it, it's that it, it that it is for me as a musician an, an inspiring thing and you know the, the other similarity that we you know that we as a band share with uh you know a co with with companies like those uh is that um you know that we're kind of we're kind of up against it there's there's a there's a bigger more commercially viable uh entertainment industry out there uh that's you know populated by wealthy individuals with extremely powerful lawyers and and you know and and business managers and you know that there there are rules that have been set in in place and and there are legal legal issues that that have existed since you know since pop music was invented that really put the artists and the independent 
you know, those of us that are independent and truly independent, uh, you know, at, at great risk because we can't, you know, we can't, we can't contend with, with them. We can't contend with the, with a lot of those laws and a lot of those loopholes. And so what we're left with is, uh, you know, the idea that we care about what we do so much and our passion is so, uh, you know, runs so deep that none of that really matters and that we're willing to put up a fight and we're willing to, you know, you know, face the, the oncoming tide of, uh, you know, an industry that's largely moving digital, that's largely moving into single based, uh, music and, you know, and the, the, the metrics by which we, you know, gauge success, uh, and, and, or, or, you know, the commercial success these days, uh, is, is becoming more and more Byzantine as time goes on because it's, you know, it's an amalgamation of, you know, your Spotify listens and your YouTube views and your physical record sales and your digital downloads. And, you know, it's, all, it's not a simple calculation. Um, it seems to grow more and more confusing with each year. And I, I think, you know, we and the stores that we distribute our record to, our records to, and the, the stores that we play acoustic sets in, are, you know, the, these are places uh, with, filled with people who understand and I don't mean to make this sound like it's like some great huge struggle. It, it is, but that's not all it's about. But you just know you're around people whose hearts are in it in a pure way, like like we like we understand ours to be. And so, the more that you know, as, as Baroness has grown as a band, I've come to understand that we we do on occasion have a platform uh, that we can use to promote or illustrate or, or shine a light on you know some of these things that exist out there that that make our lives a little bit more difficult but they could make our lives a little bit easier if things were done more more ethically and so when we you know when we when we set up uh when we were setting up purple and we were setting up golden gray um you know our the the fact that we were visiting these stores we noticed was really having an effect, you know, an effect on us, an effect on on the the owners and the, the employees, and you know, most importantly on the fans because we're bringing fans into, you know, sometimes into an environment they'd never been in before, and they didn't they didn't they didn't necessarily realize that, you know, this, this store that they drive past every day on their way to work, you know, actually is is, is filled with thousands and thousands of incredible records, um, and you know, the the other thing I the, the other reason um, that we do things like that is because as a band who's come from, you know, who, who spent a very long time touring almost, you know, like basically hand to mouth, you know, day by day, um, you know, as, as we've gained influence and, and, you know, critical acclaim and, you know, as we've seen the, the, our ticket prices go up a little bit and our guarantees get higher and all that, you know, we're, I'm trying to use what we, you know, what success we've gained in a positive way and give back to the community that, that helped raise us. And I think that, you know, in, in every case, the best way to promote music is by playing music. The best way to market and make people aware of your music is, is by, is through that music itself. And so, you know, the, the, the in stores that we've been doing recently, they're not only fun and challenging and, you know, give the, give our audience an opportunity to listen to our music in a different way, but it, it allows us to inhabit, the, the spaces where our music is, is, you know, where the physical version of our music is, is bought and sold. You know, as you were, this isn't necessarily a question I had prep, but like in listening to you talk, it, it is definitely something that we hit on quite a bit on this podcast, which is, you know, kind of talking a little bit more about just the, the balance of business and artistic, I don't want to say integrity, but are, are just the artistic license to do things. And mm-hmm. so... You know, I, I something that struck a nerve with me, not a nerve, it struck a chord with me when you guys were doing this that I thought was really cool because it wasn't like you're doing the FYEs around the major cities you're doing. These are mom and pop record stores. And it just makes me wonder, you know, you were just kind of hitting on the fact that like as your guarantees get a little bit bigger, as the rooms get a little bigger, little bit bigger, the ticket prices get a little bit bigger, do you f- try to find that you are setting out to be actively – Ah, what's the word? What's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, basically, that you're trying to not appear to be a band of the level that you're that most people would assume you're at. That you you still want to be that that band that is kind of not underground but 
level with everybody where you're not above your fans. You're, you're right there with your fans and that you're able to give something to them in spite of the fact that it's like, you know, some people might be like, oh, I'm kind of priced out now. I'm going to see a Baroness show like that. You're still trying to offer your longtime fans the, the loyalty is rewarded by doing these kind of things. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the way you phrase it, is, I, like I think about it in a slightly in slightly different terms. Like, for me, it's not a ma- it's not a matter as much that because we've grown, we are doing things that uh, that set a, a, a different type of example. It's that we've always done this and. And I, I, I think you're right. I think it is artistic integrity. I think, and I, and I think it is artistic license. But when, you know, I'll, I'll illustrate it this way: when, when, when people, when our fans, when kids have come up to me and and uh, maybe mentioned that, that that they were, you know, they were excited or thrilled or, or impressed by the fact that we were, you know, that we that we show up to record stores, we play acoustic songs, we shake everybody's hand, we meet people. We engage in regular conversations. When when people say that they're surprised by that, I'm very quick to point out that they shouldn't be surprised that we do that. It's more a case that they should be surprised when people don't do that because we we are musicians. We we we've, we've written music for people, and the music is the only you know it's the best and sometimes the only way that I am able to engage and connect with a world that I, I've oftentimes felt at odds with. And so I, I think that I think it's strange that more bands don't, you know, go out of their way to to do that. But I'm but I also want to, you know, I also want to point out the fact that I I don't want to, you know, like I, I think it's important that we we also realize who and what we are in a realistic way. And that, you know, and that, that sort of goes both ways. Like, yes, you know, we, we are not metallic or we're not Guns N' Roses. We're not the biggest band on the planet, but. It would be, you know, I think we would come. I think it would come off as presumptuous and pretentious if we tried to give the illusion that we also have been unsuccessful. You know, it's not that, it's not, it's not, it's neither one or the other. It's, it's that, you know, realistically, like we have grown. There's, there's no way to deny that. But, you know, as an aside, in spite of that growth, the, you know, the, the idea the identity and the reality of being a, 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 you know, a professional working musician has never gotten easier. You know, the, you know, as thing, as the band grows, so do, so does the overhead, so do the expenses, so do, you know, so do the complexities grow. And, you know, I've, I've always found that, you know, in Baroness, because, because of the way we, we carry ourselves, you know, and I think maybe at some, at some point, because we don't engage in the, you know, in the gross commercialism, uh, that you know, you know that that bugged us when we were fourteen and continues to bug us now that we're you know getting close to forty. Um, I think you know I I, I think it's I don't want to be I don't want to ever come off as as like complaining about my lot in life you know because because I've I've followed my passions in an in an uncompromising way and I've followed my creativity in an uncompromising way for so long that you know the fact that the fact that we've experienced success on the internal level the way that i the way that i define it but also you know in a more external way where we can provide for our families and uh you know we get by purely by playing music doesn't mean that it, it, it by no way in no way shape or form does that mean that it, it that it is easy to do so it is incredibly difficult it requires constant dedication it requires touring more than you know more than sometimes feels healthy it requires dedicating more time than sometimes feels healthy. But, you know, people that know me understand that I'm wired pretty hot. And I'm, I, you know, I live in like a you know, nearly eternal state. So it's a, it's a, it's a place where, you know, my creativity thrives, but it's, that doesn't change the fact that it's hard work and it's, and it requires so much time, so much energy, so much, so much of your own money in, as an investment in order, in order to, you know, maintain, in order to continue going. Um, uh, you know, I, I think, it, I think it's, I think it's important that people, you know, that, that people see that, uh, because my, the stage I'm standing on is six feet tall, because I have a microphone only makes me taller and louder. 
it doesn't make me more important. And I think that m- more than anything, uh, uh, you know, one of the opportunities that we that we have as a band now is to tr- really try to sh- to illustrate to our fans that there's nothing particularly special about us. We've just been playing music for a very long time, and and we never stopped when the you know essentially when the world when the world you know sort of you know gave me the clues that I should stop doing it because you know I was getting broken and bruised and battered and you know there was doubts and criticism you know when the world was giving me that input I wasn't hearing it because I because I believe in what I'm doing and that again that doesn't make that doesn't make me special that just you know, that's just like anybody who cares about what they do for, for work. Uh, it just so happens that my work, you know, takes me on wild adventures around the globe and, and, you know, and, and looks, looks, you know, looks, and in, in fact, you know, maybe sometimes is kind of glamorous cause I get to travel so much, but it's, but it's hard. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that just in spite of how hard it is, you know, the work is, uh, you know, on the level of musicians, uh, if we don't, have an audience and if our audience doesn't make the same sacrifice then we stop existing because we we can't exist without our audience and our shows would you know you know the way the way i would put it to people you know when i'm on stage is that we could play a a, a technically perfect show if our audience isn't energized if they're not singing along if they're not participating then it's a it's a horrible show if we play sloppy and scrappy but the energy is there and the crowd's transmitting that back to us and reflecting that, then it's a, then it's the best show. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. You know, what, what I do is like admittedly weird sometimes, uh, because it, it's so it seemingly doesn't follow the, the normal rules of professionalism, but, and, you know, in fact, if you are, if your ethics are flexible, you can become extremely wealthy doing this but my ethics and my morals are not flexible. Uh, so the, you know, the, some of the work, you know, move as, as we move forward is actually just maintaining the same attitude that we've had. That's been so good for us in the past, you know, back when nobody gave two shits who we were, um, we had an enthusiasm that carried us through that. And I'd like to think that, you know, 20 years on or 15 years on or whatever it is that that enthusiasm hasn't dimmed. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible to me that it hasn't. And, you know, I, like, I, I occasionally will set up situations just to prove that to myself. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's, always, it's always there. And I think, um, you know, I think of nothing else. We, we, we hopefully can set a decent example for, uh, you know, for the next generation of artists or for younger kids or, or just for, you know, for, for fans. We can just stand in opposition to the, uh, you know, the presumption that, the artist is a celebrity or, or, or is, is the talent, you know, and is, and is in some way, some fundamental way more important. That's not the case. You know, what ties me uh, musically to our audience is the, the themes of our lyrics, which I, which I think are universal themes, which I think are things we all feel. And so in a way I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just expressing, I'm expressing the things that I, I think, we share, we have in common, those universal themes. And, you know, I think as such, if I were to adopt a stance that I was, you know, more, more powerful than, than, than the people who pay tickets to see us play, I think I'd be doing a great disservice, not just to our audience, but to myself and to any progress I might have as a human being, you know, I take it really seriously. I mean, I'm not like, you know, I, I get real deep on it, but I do take things ex- extremely seriously. Well, I mean, you know, kind of speaking to that and something that I think is kind of interesting and, you know, listening to the new record today and thinking about the fact that at this point now in the band's career, you are the only original member. And looking back at some of the, like when Purple was coming out and so forth and looking back to the fan expectation, the the critical expectation and so forth, and just the expectation that I would assume you guys are putting on yourselves when putting out these new records – it's interesting to me that in spite of the fact that you have new blood coming in, you guys seem to thrive almost on on having to exceed the bar that's been set by everybody, whether it be you, the critical reception, the fans, whatever. It seems that you are one of the few bands that when there's a, a shift in dynamics that you guys excel and create something that elevates what Baroness is to everybody, and so yourselves included, I would imagine. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 I think that, 
my 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 personal experience as as a uh, you know low these past four decades has been has been very difficult. You know, I've I've suffered uh, some fairly extreme and dramatic things in public uh, and in private. Like all of us, I've suffered you know those similar traumas and similar experiences and thing you know just you know you name it I've, I've, i feel like i feel like i have never learned a lesson any other way than the hardest way possible and i have come not only to be <laughs> you know slightly wary of of my own potential for you know getting myself into trouble but i've also had to learn how to take what could be seen as a misfortune or what could be seen as a stumbling block. And in fact, view it only as an opportunity. So when, when lineup changes have happened, I, I, I have no other choice um, other than to see each new member as an opportunity for the band to grow. And that's, that's that in and of itself is a tricky thing because when we talk about progress as, a, as musicians, we talk about growth, some, some people conflate that some musicians conflate that with change. Um, I've never ever tried to change the fundamental core existence of the band. Like that has, that's one thing that cannot change, but with each member comes a new skill set and comes a new, a potentially new, uh, style of writing or, uh, you know, a new character that can get added into the band. And I'm, you know, I, I, I don't consider this my band with, you know, three people that I, that I happen to play with. I consider this the, our band and our crew and the whole team that works on everything. I consider the family and everybody, everybody works hard and every, you know, everybody puts their, everybody puts their full, you know, their full energy and passion into it. So, um, I, you know, I think we, I think the only thing that we do is we, uh, you know, as the lineups have changed is we're, we are, we have like, it's, it's like when we're writing songs, we kind of have one rule. It's like at the end of it, it doesn't matter what, you know, soft song, loud song, fast song, slow song, sad song, up tempo. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. What matters is that it feels right and that it feels like a Baroness song. And, you know, I, I, would, I, I think at this point, I'm not even the only person that can judge that. I think, you know, Nick and Sebastian have been in the band long enough that they, they, they have developed a very keen sense of, um, you know, as we're, as we're creating music, like what, what feels genuine and what doesn't feel genuine. And, and if you hold yourself to the standard that you should constantly be, constantly be improving your skills as a songwriter and that, uh, that a big, huge portion of, of that improvement uh, revolves around becoming more genuine and speaking more honestly through your instrument, through your lyrics, through your uh, you know, voice, whatever you name it. Then I think, I, then I think you don't need, you don't need external pressure because you're trying to, you know, because what, you know, essentially what we, we, we have such high expectations of, of each other and on ourselves that we don't, we just simply don't need, we don't need external pressure to, uh, to force us to move forward. Um, and it's, that's never, that it's, it's always been like that. So I don't really know what, you know, I don't have the experience, I don't have the experience of being in any other bands. I don't know how other bands work. I just know that this one works seemingly the best under high stress situations and very importantly, I guess I kind of skipped this when I was talking about this, but we don't write music for our fans. We don't write music for the labels. We don't write music for the radio. We don't write music for anybody other than ourselves because we trust that if we are creatively, passionately engaged and involved and challenged with our own music, then that the transitive property will kick in and our, our audience and the public will respond in the same way. And that's proven itself to be true with each record that we've put out. So that's a formula that, that, that is only constructive and only positive. Therefore that formula is not one that I'm trying to change. You know, uh, you know, we just want to write music that we haven't heard anybody do yet. We want to write songs that we wish other people had written because they're hard to write uh, and that, that, that keeps us, that keeps us pretty fresh, you know? Absolutely. I, I don't know how much has been made of this, but I, I feel like there are some interesting avenues to discover, uh, and explore with this question and this line of thought. Um, 
at this point now that uh, Golden Gray is out, you have said that this is the last of the chromatically themed records. So it makes me wonder a couple of things. It makes me wonder if along the process, obviously, I don't think I've I've read or seen you say outwardly that, you know, like, oh, I had this concept in mind and it was going to last blank amount of records. But with mm -hmm. that being said, you know, this is now at this point six albums into a collection did you know when writing this record, like, this is it? This is the last of of this series of albums that will be titled under this umbrella? Or was there always kind of this, this grandiose plan of, like, it's going to be six albums and you, you kind of knew where it was going to go all along? Or did the music speak to you and tell you when it was going to be done? It was, it's a, it, on, the honest answer is there's a bit of both. The, the idea, the, the high concept answer started off as a joke uh because because it, and, and some people are, are are unfamiliar with this but but they're but as an artist like there there is a color wheel it it has six colors in it it's red orange yellow green and blue and violet and purple yeah so roy g biv is the whole idea you know it's the primary colors and the secondary colors that was it and it was a joke that our drummer alan uh Told when after we got after we got signed to Relapse Records, he said, you know, we because because I always had this, you know, I always had a philosophy in mind that because we because we as a band of you know because of that the original lineup of we were all friends from growing up because we never fit in anywhere to begin with because we were always we always felt at odds with the system around us of course, becoming, you know, of course, entering, uh, you know, at that point of the, of the larger, a larger musical sphere meant that we were going to, if we were going to be a metal band, we were going to do something different with it. And at the time, this has all changed since then, but at the time there was this very like sort of stock kind of uh, imagery that was used that, you know, that most, most bands would use. It was, you know, it's, it was either like very stark, symbolic, uh, you know, heavy, heavy use of like sort of simple, bold icons, or there was the, you know, like the real, like kind of macho skulls and, you know, TNA kind of like cheesy overwrought kind of thing that was happening with, with, with other bands, you know, like, it, and none of it worked for me. Uh, I thought, you know, we, I was talking to Alan, I was, I was thinking, you know, think, just think how cool it would be if we, to, you know, if if we as and then all of us were like six two and you know like a bat or over two hundred pounds at that time, it was, it was a tall, big, thick band. And I was thinking, I was you know, I was like, well, we we should we should really be aware of our own masculinity here because that can work against us. You know, I've seen so many bands where it's the, you know it just becomes this testosterone test, and it's all alpha alpha guys being alpha guys, and there's you know it's about beating your chest and acting like a gorilla and dominating and winning, you know, and that whole, that whole attitude and spirit, while it didn't exist in the four of us, like we, we, so, so, so my, my thought was like, if we showed, if we, if we showed that as masculine looking men, that we had a feminine side, that that's something that was softer, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this is, this is like the thought, this is my thinking at into, you know, 2002, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think like this now, but my thought was, you know, if, it, or maybe, maybe just, maybe not feminine, maybe the word would be something that stands against that masculinity, that, that, that sort of machismo thing. Um, and, and, and that to me, that included the, you know, the style of art that I current, that, that I was already making, which was softer and, and like colorful and had curves. And, um, you know, I, I thought it would, we would just kind of be a stick in the mud and that would be cool. And Alan said uh, to me, because we, we had released a couple of EPs that had, that they were like sequentially titled first, second, third. He said, well, you know, now we're doing full lengths. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be cool to, if like, if we did, you know, the color wheel, um, it just, he said, you know, just think after six records, we'd have a rainbow on our merch table and that would look amazing. And, and, you know, we kind of laughed about it at the time because there was no fucking way we were going to get through six records. We, we, we were surprised that anybody wanted to sign us for one. So it was just sort of a, you know, it was sort of a joke at first, but as, as we started to make our first record red, um, 
I realized that it, it was not just a great jumping off point, not just a great way of under explaining what was inside the record, not just a great way of creating sim- symbolism and a gr- you know, a great way to like start making the album cover, but it also, it, it had, it had all these layers that you could get into if you wanted to. So, you know, so we stuck with it, blue, yellow, and green. And after yellow and green, I was like, all right, now I've been doing this for like so many years. I, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that I want to be like a concept band. And I really never wanted to, to turn into a concept in the traditional sense where, you know, there's a story that runs through them um, or, or, that there, or that there's like some narrative thing. Every record is about the same thing. Every record is a, that we've released is about the experience that, that uh, is, is lyrically or conceptually about the experiences, reactions, and feelings that I've had since the record before it. So whatever's happened in the past three, three or four years, that's what Golden Gray is about. You know, there was three years in between Purple and Yellow and Green. So Purple was about those three years. Um, and that, that's, that's, as, that's as deep into any concept as I'm willing to go. The color theming thing was only, you know, it was something that I tried to give up on it before Purple. I was like, yeah, we should stop now. But, uh, you know, Pete, our guitar player at the time, convinced me that it, it was actually really cool how far we had gone with it. So I really just couldn't stomach the idea of calling our last album Orange. Um, though it is, though, clear, though clearly it is. You know, look at the cover, man, it's Orange. Like, obviously, obviously it's Orange. Uh, and this is, you know, Golden Gray was as close as I could get to calling it Orange. So, you know, because of because of the you know due to the nature of the fact that it was only ever six colors, yes, that era is over. But more importantly, I've been doing the same titling theory for 13 years. That's a long time to be working on any kind of project. I just want the freedom in the future to do whatever. So maybe our next album's pink or taupe or you know burgundy or whatever. It doesn't matter. I want to be able to have that choice. I don't want to, I, I don't want to feel locked into it. You know what I mean? So really like at the end of the day, it, it did feel like, it did feel like we closed the chapter. You know what I mean? It, it, it honestly did feel like that, but not until we were wrapping up with the recording. So it maybe it was a self-fulfilling prophecy or something like that. It's, it's hard for me to say, but you know, I've had a lot of fun with it since we started. I just, I, I just think like at this point, moving forward, if we were to continue that, uh, you know, in a direct way, if I was to commit to it now, I'm just blocking the other, any other option that I would have. And I think it would be nice for the first time in 13 years to have, you know, kind of a, a blank canvas in front of me next time. I don't know how different, you know, things will be moving forward, but I have, we have the, we have the choice. We have the freedom to do it now. So, this is going to be kind of a multifaceted question because you, you touched on one of the questions I had as a follow-up uh, and then something we've kind of been touching on as a whole. So forgive the long-winded rant here. Is there plans now that this this chromatic series is done, would you like to do a deluxe box set? Some kind of imagery that ties everything together that maybe people haven't seen uh, in the individual components? And then kind of on the other side of that, you know, you kind of already touched on the fact that the idea conceptually to do something beyond what you've done already seems pretty freeing. Have you th- thought about just, you know, I, I know the record just came out, but I mean, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you are someone who thinks about things just constantly. Your mind probably constantly is going. So it makes me wonder like now that you're like, okay, the chromatic series is done. Oh my God. What, what, Wealth of possibilities are there in store for Baroness on all creative platforms at this point? Well, yeah, that was that really was two separate questions. The first, the answer to the first question about about a bo- about a box set uh, presented in a in a in a w- with some additional materials. Of course, that that sounds amazing. Um, I think it I think it will be difficult to achieve because it's there there are are there are more that is more than just the self-owned label at you know it would be that would be involved so i'm sure it would be it would be a tricky thing but uh you know ultimately i i i can't imagine that not happening i cannot i can't even fathom the like this band going another 10 years and and those six records not getting packaged up in a cool way with 
with new content and, you know, fresh artwork, but, but with, a, you know, something that's concise and gathers all of, all of these things in one place. Because now that I'm, now that I have, you know, a month and a half of hindsight on it, I realized that the albums do fit together in a, and there are, there never really has been a difference between the records and there never has been a difference with me between the music that I make and the artwork that I make. I, I've, I've come to accept that I just, there, there, I just have a couple outlets for my creativity, but it's, it, it all comes from the same place. It's all about the same thing. And because I, because I don't believe in things like writing like sci-fi fantasy concept records, uh, you know, I think the, I think the history of these past six records is, is really, uh, sometimes a very difficult picture of, you know, what I've been through, I mean, at least for me, it's a very difficult look back at what my life's been like since we, you know, since the band started putting out full lengths, but it is, there is a absolutely a theme that runs through it. That there's a common thread that they all have and they all feel like individual pieces of a, a, gr- a much greater project to me. So yes, moving forward, I'm very excited about the you know, f- future prospects for the band because I've never felt like we, I've never felt like we as a band in any of the lineups are limited to being, you know, a, a group of four musicians and, uh, you know, the singer makes artwork. I, I, I think there's so much more that we're, we, we're capable of doing. Uh, you know, the, the only restraints that I feel that we have at this point are, you know, the restraints of the, the time, <laughs> time, money, and, and more than anything else, the limits of our creativity. So, whatever we can think of, we're going to do, you know, whatever excites us, we're going to engage in. Um, but believe it or not, I don't think in advance because I, I'm not wired like that. My brain doesn't op- My brain is always working at a hundred percent and it never slows down and I never stop moving. I never stop. I can't stop. It's I'm too manic, I'm too compulsive. I'm too like, yeah, I'm, I'm I, I run way too weird. Uh, to stop thinking, but I also have come to accept that, uh, that I don't, re- I don't plan things out as well as I do things in the moment. And that sounds weird because if you look at my work, if you look at, if you listen to the band, you know, the band's recorded outlet output, it sounds like there's a lot of labor in there and there is, and there's a lot of detail and there is, and there's a lot of meaning and symbolism and, le- and, and layers of meaning and things stacked on and reflections of things and reprisals there, of course, that, that, that stuff's all there, but because I, because of the fact or due to the fact that, you know, my artistic work is done in a permanent media where any mistake that's made is visible. And because, because the music, you know, will outlive me and because my tendency as a, as a songwriter is to embellish and make lots of little things constantly swirling around. Uh, I've, I've learned that the fact that I do everything, the fact that I, I have a tendency towards spontaneity is actually kind of a good thing because in a, in a, in a very layered, detailed, uh, obsessed over, poor, you know, uh, like critically analyzed thing, I know that most of the decisions were made without thinking. The most of the decisions were made as expressions rather than um, well thought out things. It makes, makes, makes me very hard to work with, I think, for other people. Um, and I, I, I give so much credit to Gina and Nick and Sebastian for putting up with me, you know, for this record, because this is the one where I did not, I wasn't done. I wouldn't stop until we were done, until I was done, until I was satisfied that everything we did was the best version of everything that we were, go- we were capable of doing. And even if we wanted to go back and try to re-record any of those songs, they would come out differently because the way we made them was so spontaneous and so labyrinthine and byzantine in the way that it was done that there's no way to replicate it um so yeah it's it's just it's, it's it's there are parts of my personal characteristics that 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 i that i was born with or that i that i've developed that i just i just hate you know <laughs> Some of it, i just I'm like man i wish i wish i wasn't a space case and uh obsessed with details because that makes things really confusing for me um uh, you know, I, I wish I wasn't like a depressive person who, who, a, who is exhilarated by music in such an extreme way. Cause it's like, you know, going hot to cold like that. 
that quickly is sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a very intense experience. Um, but I think, you know, I, I would, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. You know, I, I, I love all the experiences I've had except one or two, you know? Absolutely. So kind of in, in wrapping up, because I think I only got you for a couple more minutes, I used to work at a screen printing place uh, dealing with t-shirts and so forth and, and being into uh, screen printing as far as posters and so forth and, and artists like Jermaine Rogers and Derek Hess. Um, mm-hmm. Jermaine Rogers, I went to this uh, art gallery. I think it's called Art on Fifth. It's in Austin, Texas uh, when I went on a yeah. vacation. And the guy that runs the, the shop, I can't remember the guy's name. I wanted to have him on the podcast because he's phenomenal. Um, long and short of it, he was going through all of Jermaine's like, posters and the artist prints and so forth and just being like, oh, this is a paper, and, and we decided to call it this because it was the first time anyone really had used it, so we didn't really know what to call it. Uh, and talking right. about the textures and, and the, the various kind of aspects of the paper and the way it's woven and and uh, the way that he Jermaine was kind of printing on it and so forth so then even talking to you know I've had Derek Hess on here about a year ago and you know something I was kind of talking to him about at the time was he was really getting into printing on like uh, metals and so forth and finding these kind of abstract things to create art on and so knowing that you are a graphic artist as well it kind of has made me wondered what has got you interested right now in that realm and you know, does having these new capabilities of things to, to, to create on, does it just really, has it really inspired you artistically in a way that really hasn't uh, been unlocked so far? Um, you mean, are, are you asking if my, if, if the content, you know, the, the great wealth of contemporary media is what, is what excites me? Is that what you're at? Like, like, I mean, I guess guess there's that, but it's also, I mean, like, um, you know, something that kind of was shocking to me and going just in screen printing on on garments, you know, it was an industry I had never really been in, involved in in any way, shape, or form. And to see how we have various kinds of inks between water-based ink Uh, and so forth, to then even having, like, puff ink and stuff like that, so where it, it reacts differently once you go down the dryer and it puffs up, to then talking to someone like Derek Hess, who's like, you know, I've done stuff on canvas, I've done stuff on paper. But it's this whole thing, like, now there's there's ways that we can print on metal, uh, screen yeah. print on metal and so forth. And I know, like, there are people like uh, Sean uh, from Child Bite, a, a band here in Detroit, but he's also a graphic designer, and he does a lot of stuff, and his band does a lot of stuff on, like, the D side of a, of a vinyl and so forth. That You know, I've just kind of been very, become very aware of the, the many things you can create art on that don't seem obvious uh, to an outsider. And so it just kind of okay, makes me wonder... In light of all of these new mediums, I guess, of ways to express your art, does it kind of inspire you to try to create something? Because maybe you have something and you're like, ah, I just don't think it'd look great on canvas. But man, you know what? Seeing this thing on metal has me really excited to create something on that. <laughs> I wish my answer was yes, but I think, I think, uh, you know, like kind of in a blunt way, no. Uh, I have, I, you know, I, and, and I will explain this. Like, I work in a very I, the work that I am known best for is very, is done in very using very traditional media. Like I, I use watercolors. Uh, I limit I limit anything that's I, I limit the, my use of anything that isn't watercolor at this point. Uh, like I'll use a little bit of ink, like uh, you know, like more modern ink at, at times for certain effects. But most of what I do is a paintbrush and antique form of paint on an antique form of paper, a hundred percent cotton. And the majority of my work lives I- exclusively in that realm. And I hate it in a way because, because, because I, w- when I, when I learned, when I learned how, you know, and as I learned art, I was, I was taught or I, t- I taught myself oil painting, which is, uh, a very different than watercolor put it that way it's it's like it's almost a reverse process you build you can build things you can sculpt you work from dark to light you can cover things but generally speaking when you're working in oil paint uh or acrylic paint or or most physical paints even even screen printing the objects that are the lightest the white ink is generally the last thing. It's the topmost layer, uh, because we as human beings decipher and read light as being as having volume, and we read shadow 
as uh, as the lack thereof. It's sort of a weird thing that just you know that we do. So um, working in watercolor, you're you are working like basically if I want something white on watercolor paper, I avoid painting it. So you have to work around it. You're yeah, you're working and you're you're using you're using uh, your uh, you're using your pigments like in, a little like at times in almost a backwards way, and it's super limiting. And I never, I never, ever, 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 ever in a million years thought I would become a watercolor paper or painter. I never, ever wanted that, thought that, studied it, did anything with it. But it's become what I do. And what's been inspiring to me recently is that I have turned this thing that I resent on so many levels. I have, I have finally begun to understand its, its practicality as a platform for true creative expression uh, and the way that, the way that I see it. Uh, whereas before I was a little bit more like old school and I thought, you know, watercolor is, is like for studying and practicing and oils or, or what you paint your serious work with. Um, but, you know, then I became a guy who was doing work with pen and ink, you know, and watercolor. And th- these were things that I, re- I really never thought I'd be doing. And so, so I, I grew that I, I got this resentment for them. And I, as soon as I realized how like bitter I was becoming about the techniques and the media itself, the more committed I was to learning how to love it. And I went through a couple of years of just drilling myself on uh, learning how to draw better, learning how to paint better, using the things that, uh, you know, that I was known for, but that I disliked. And I did, I was doing these, uh, like, in fact, I, I, there's these pens called micron pens. They're like really, they're technical pens. They're not expressive. The line width doesn't change. You can't make a beautiful line with it. You can just make a straight line with it. And I'm not good at straight lines. You know, my work is messy and all over the place. And I hate media like that. It's permanent and, you know, permanent and unexpressive. So in order to become a better artist, I did a series of 200 drawings using nothing but microns. And I call it the frustrating micron series where I would, I would give myself a finite amount of time to work because, you know, when I do album covers, it's hundreds of hours. I'd give myself a couple hours to do anything. And when it was done, I would let go of it. I'd sell it. I'd give it to somebody. Uh, I'd throw it away, whatever. I just had to learn how to become non-precious. I had, I had to learn how to move quickly. I had to learn how to use uh, papers and pens and pigments and inks and watercolors and techniques that I never really wanted to know. I had to, I had to embrace them and love them. And now what's been inspiring to me recently is falling in love with those things. The printed work that happens with me, I do with, I work with, uh, you know, an extremely cutting edge group of screen printers in Minneapolis called burlesque of North America. And through, through their, through their, uh, the way that they think about screen printing is, is like really at times avant-garde and very forward thinking. And, and they're, they're the people who are, you know, who have turned me on to, you know, these, these newer printing techniques. I don't print printing is for people who are finicky and clean and, and, and are capable of doing things in a precise way. I'm not, but I'm fascinated by it. So I attend the printings and I work very closely with them so that we can, you know, hopefully bump it. And so now I'm, I'm circling back because my initial answer was no, and I'm going to turn it into a yes now. So I'm, I'm learning these things through, through my screen printers and watching them do accomplishing feats of printing that I could never accomplish things that blow my mind. And I'm learning how those things are done. I'm learning about those things and how to do them. Uh, not so that I can, so that I understand the process so that I can take my, my, my artwork and, create better and better, more genuine, more expressive, more interesting representations of it as it becomes printed so that the audience that, ha- you know, that has come to collect my artwork has access to better artwork. And that's, that's affordable. That's in a, within a price range that they can afford where my originals gener- you know, generally like aren't, aren't priced for everyday buyers. Uh, I like to, uh, you know, the reason I print is because I don't want to exclude people. Uh, and I, and I, I, I've collected prints over my lifetime and I have great appreciation for people who really deal exclusively in prints. 
uh, which I, which I don't, I don't, I don't like it because I have, then it becomes a commercial thing. Then I have to sell them and, and all this. I like working with this company because they're like, they're, they are like the closest, they're, they are, they're the closest thing that printmaking has to being fine art. I mean, it, it, not even, I don't mean closest. I mean, they are fine art screen printers and that makes, that makes, that inspires me to create more because that, that allows the you know the people who are interested in having originals of my of my work or very nice looking reproductions done well by people who care by by true artists and true craftsmen and so 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 yeah I mean I, I think it I think you know where I'm at nowadays which is you know I've got my fingers in a whole lot of little pies out there and I'm just trying to learn how to do everything myself um, you know like all of it, you know, at a certain point, all of it becomes inspiring because you surround, you have to surround yourself with people who are amazing at what they do and put the same amount of care into, uh, you know, handling your artwork and reproducing it that you did in making it in the first place. And that applies to screen printers. That applies to record manufacturers. That applies to the indie retailers that we started this conversation about. And that applies to our fans and the clubs and everything. You know, I want in a perfect world, everybody cares. Everybody is passionate, you know? Absolutely. Well, I <laughs> I can't think of a better way to have encompassed the uh, almost hour-long conversation we've had at this point. So uh, where can people find you or the band online, and uh, what does the rest of 2019 have for you? Uh, I think a Google search will pretty much give you everything you need. Uh, B-A-R-O-N-E-S-S. Um, that will get you to our website, you know, YouTube channels and all that. Uh, and then what was the next question? What are we doing after after 2019? Uh, just what does the rest of this year have for you at this point? Uh, we're just touring till the end of the year. We have no, almost no time off. It just <laughs> shows. Fair enough. You know, actually, I do have one last question for you because I, I was Googling this uh, earlier because I, I figured a band of your, your level had to have put out a beer or been involved in making a beer of some kind. And I do see that there is a, a brand, I think it's called the Temptest, uh, brewing or something like that that has a Baroness beer, but I don't think you have anything to do with it. So would uh, going in the route of like a Mastodon or any of the bands that have kind of done a beer, would that be something you'd be interested in? Or at the very least, uh, would you like to do artwork for a beer, beer label? Uh, we've, I, we, you know, the funny thing is we've, we've done, we've partnered with a, uh, I believe we've partnered with a company, a small, small brewing company in Florida uh, to do like a very limited, like one night only, uh, I think it's like a golden lager or something like that. Um, but it's sort of difficult for me to engage in that like fully because I, I have, uh, been a recovering alcoholic since 2000. Um, so I'm the, like the rest of my band and the crew and everybody else, like they can drink as much as they like, but, uh, you know, as, as a recovering alcoholic, it's very hard for me to get too entrenched or behind, uh, you know, the sale, the sale of alcohol, just because I, the, I have a stigma with it. But that's not to say that I entirely demonize it, because I realize that for some people it is, you know, it's, a, it's very recreational and it's 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 awesome. And you know, the, 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 the microbrew industry has been very kind to our band over the years. We played tons of festivals and, and so all sorts of things like that. So yeah, I mean, we sort of flirt with it now and then. Uh, but never, never too seriously, just just because of that. I think uh, Metallica would do wise to to kind of heed your advice on that, then, because uh, I just recently had their Inner Night beer, and it is shit. And it reminds yeah. me of the fact that bands who no longer drink probably shouldn't be have a hand in making beer of any kind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with all the beer related matters, I, I I I kick that straight across to the other three guys because they because because they do have opinions and they they do remember what it tastes like, which I don't at this point. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, you know, I think, I think the thing was the thing when we've done this, cause actually now that I'm thinking about, it, we've done quite, it's happened quite a few times where we've done like limited one night only sort of things. And we're, you know, I think they're always like, dude, we just want like a cheap tasting, easy drinking beer, not something heavy. Like, especially if we're going to take it on stage and have to drink it. Like we want something, <laughs> we want something light and easy, which is not what microbreweries love making. Um, so therein lies the difficulty, but you know, this is first world problems. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for taking the time tonight and talking and, uh, enjoy your show tonight and the safe travels. Yeah. And hopefully we'll see you back here. I would assume so. We'll see you in Grand Rapids probably sooner than later. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So that was my conversation with John from Baroness. Like I said in the intro and, and kind of, like I said, if you've uh, checked out any of the other interviews that John has done, 
really appreciative of the time that he took. He, they were on tour still uh, at that point. So, I mean, taking 45 minutes to an hour to, to do a podcast, uh, it's pretty pretty unheard of. A lot of times it's like you get 20 minutes tops uh, and then you're out. Yeah, totally. He, he definitely gave you uh, the whole cake and a little bit more. It made me wonder if uh, he, if he only does like one interview a day or two interviews a day just so he can give everyone their their time. Maybe I mean that's that's pretty that's pretty respectful to the podcasters. I mean, in this industry, people are like, yeah, fifteen minutes, that's good, right? I'm like, I mean, I guess, but <laughs> you know, I, it's one of those we'll take what we can get. But I, I do like it whenever somebody will actually take the time and have a real conversation versus versus yeah. just giving us you know again like we talked about the intro like just canned answers yes or no answers are almost worse than canned answers <laughs> and uh i guess the contrast i'm trying to make here is that you know he even at one point you asked two questions in one and he was like okay so that was two questions so let me go back and answer the first <laughs> one so you get like five minutes there and then you know it's a, like I, I thought that was cool very informative uh, yeah if you walked away from this and didn't learn anything uh, about john or baroness or you know any anything from anything i asked then uh, i i guess you weren't listening totally man yeah you, you, th- this is definitely a good jumping on point if you don't know anything about the band that you're going to find out whether you like it or not you know, just based on this. Well, I think that was the thing for me when I knew I had, like, sometimes knowing out the gate that you're going to have 40 minutes with someone or 45 minutes, yeah. preparing for that question-wise is kind of daunting because, like, you're, you're looking at things and it's like, I didn't know if I overprepared by having too many questions, knowing that John will answer everything in depth. Right. And so, like, there were some questions, like, when I was getting to, like, the, you know, now that the, the Chromatic series is done, are you going to put out a bo- like a vinyl box set with some crazy, you know, all in like new packaging of some sorts or whatever? And he was just like, "Yeah, I would love to do that." And then you know, kind of explained like why he would love to do that. But then some of the the pitfalls of, you know, some of these are put out on different labels, so like that gets a little sketchy. But yes, ultimately, we would really love to do something like that. And I'm sitting there going like, "Do Baroness fans give a shit?" <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, Bar- Baroness fans already have their own box, you know. <laughs> they already have all the albums. They could they could put it in a box if they want it. I, yeah, I suppose. But, I mean, it's just one of those things, like, sometimes, like, and that's the thing, like, I, you know, it almost felt like dealing with periphery all over again where I'm like, man, Baroness fans are, like, so loyal, so diehard. Like, they know so much about every record, you know, just a lot of the, the things that are going on and so forth. And it was just like... Is this just a bullshit question? Like, am I wasting John's time asking this? Are whoever whoever's super stoked on Baroness are they going to listen to this and be like, "What a fucking noob"? Maybe. I mean, I don't think they're as bad as Tool fans, but uh, oh, you're bashing on them for the second time. Yeah, in, like as many weeks. Yeah, I don't know. Well, it's so funny. So, like, I I posted a meme. A, oh, I saw a that. Tool meme earlier, and like, it really wasn't anything negative about the band at all. Not it was just uh, it was just the classic, you know, Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? And, you know, in this particular meme, it had Maynard standing there and said, I will find the center in you. I will chew it up and leave, which is what we <laughs> all do to Tootsie Pops, man. It wasn't bashing on Tool, but, you know, there's always just that one guy that's going to comment and be all like, you know what? Oh, I'm really tired. Like, like he, he even said, like, the meme is funny. Yeah. But then a whole paragraph of like, I'm so sick of seeing people bashing on Tool, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, dude. I mean, it's just it's just it's supposed to be funny. Now it's funny. I posted another Tool meme today, and nobody <laughs> responded to it at all, which is great. Is it the uh, Tim Allen Tool time? No, it was um, <laughs> it was uh, a pair of scissors going between the uh, uh, going between a picture of the mind and the body. And there's like a, it's like cutting a ribbon between the mind and the body, and the the scissors says overthinking, overanalyzing, separates the body from the mind. Anyway, <laughs> I get it. The Lateral's. joke's not funny if you have to explain it, right? Yeah, no, it makes it funnier. <laughs> 
But uh, speak, speaking of making things less funny, uh, let's uh, let's let's wrap up this episode. Uh, given the fact that it was kind of longer, and, and obviously we're just talking about memes <laughs> at this point. Um, so once again, I want to thank uh, John from taking the time while on tour to do this interview. And uh, if you would like to keep up with Baroness, you can find them simply enough on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Your Baroness. If you would like to keep up with John, you can find him on Instagram at A Perfect Monster and Twitter at his name. Simple enough. Uh, if you would like to keep up with Metal Nexus, you can find them at Metal Nexus. Net, Metal Nexus on Facebook, Instagram at Metal.Nexus, Twitter at Metal underscore Nexus, and Dan will tell you where he can be found. Well, ironically, I can be found on Facebook just under my name, and I can be found on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan, I can be found on e- on Gmail, actually, uh, at Discuss Metal Dan at gmail.com, and uh, I have another podcast called Discography Discussion. It's a thing that I do, and you should check that out. It's at uh, DiscussMetal.com. And if you would like to keep up with all things this podcast, you can do such at Brew Speak Pod on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check us out on YouTube. There will be some uh, upcoming videos of some of the upcoming interviews that we have and uh, some of the past ones as well. Uh, we have Patreon, patreon.com slash Pod. if you would like to support us monetarily. Uh, rating, reviewing, subscribing, all of those things are important to us as well. So wherever you're listening to this, I'm sure there's a button to do one of those things. Uh, helps us out tremendously. And if you would like to keep up with our show sponsor, The Bean Bastard, you can do such at TheBeanBastard.com. Looks like they got some uh, good collaborations. They got a, it looks like they had a barrel uh, bourbon something or other uh, coffee, I think I just saw. Um, so I, might, I, I keep saying I'm going to have to get some coffee. I'm going to definitely have to hit up Maruso uh, probably tomorrow and make a, a big, uh, big purchase. And uh, maybe we'll do another coffee giveaway. <laughs> and... Uh, if you would like to keep up with them on Facebook and Instagram, you can find them simple enough at The Bean Bastard. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John. And I am Dan. And we will talk to you all next time.